Hello everybody, good afternoon and you are all very welcome to this session which is on the application form for Chartered or Incorporated Engineer Registration. I'm going to be sharing with you the secrets of exactly what our assessors will be looking for in the application form and the pitfalls that you need to avoid. So this session is a little bit shorter than the sessions we normally run, it's just 30 minutes, so I'll be going through the slides quite quickly with you. Um, but as I say, it's has been put together as a result of reviewing hundreds of application forms myself over the past two years in particular, and also as a result of having conversations with lots of assessors and a number of facilitators as well. So I do hope that it will be a useful session for you. Um, we'll be sending a copy of the slides out to everybody who's requested them. And because this session is shorter than normal, there won't be time for questions, but you can get in touch after the session today with any additional queries or questions that you have. You can see my email address is on the screen at the moment. Um, I'm Sandra, and I work as part of the business development team with the institution. Um, I'm going to start off today by telling you a little bit about us. Um, we're a team of people that spend pretty much all of our time providing help, guidance and support to companies and also to applicants. And we do that through a combination of uh, workshops on, for example, preparing your application form, on what to expect at interview, doing membership surgeries, which are an opportunity for you as an applicant to get some one-to-one -one advice, guidance and support. We also do mentor training events and we also guide companies through the process of setting up either an approved or accredited training scheme. Now, with COVID, we've had to change our events from meeting people face-to-face -to, -face to doing virtual events and details of all the open events that we arrange, which pretty much anyone anywhere can join, are on the website. And my colleague Philip has very kindly agreed to change, um, sorry, my colleague Philip has agreed to share links to the most important pages uh, on the website with you today. So do keep a, a look on the chat because you'll be able to see um, where you can find relevant information after the session today. So uh, Philip is our new Business Development Executive for London and he will be sharing the links in the chat today with you as well. But as I said, all of the workshops that we organise um, as open events can be arranged as in-company workshops too. So you can see on the screen at the moment details of all our team. If you already are in touch with your local contact, that's great. If not, you can get in touch with them. So if, for example, you're based in Glasgow and you'd like to have an event or company visit, please get in touch with me. If, however, you're based down in Bristol and you'd like to do the same thing, get in touch with my colleague Craig, or for example, if it's Yorkshire, then you get in touch with Dennis. Um, and Jacqueline, uh, our colleague, looks after uh, email inquiries for all of us. So the email address for Jacqueline is bdm at imake.org. So if you're not sure who's the best person for you to speak with, you can get in touch with Jacqueline and she'll be able to help you. So um, we're your local help, guidance and support. And we're really here really to help all applicants, uh, no matter what your circumstances are. So please do get in touch if you haven't already been in touch with us. Now, as you all know, in order to gain professional registration, there are three distinct steps. And I'll go over these very, very briefly with you because I hope that because you've signed up for the session today, you're already familiar with what those steps are. But uh, the first thing you need to do is ensure that you meet the academic requirements for the grade of registration that you're applying for. So for chartered engineer status, you'll need to have an accredited MEng or equivalent. For incorporated engineer status, you'll need to have an accredited BEng or equivalent. If you're unsure of the status of the academic qualification that you hold, please use the qualifications checker on our website. Then you will need to develop competence over a period of about three to four years or longer in some cases. And you can use the tools that are provided by IMECE to record your initial professional development. So it may be that you're employed by a company that runs an accredited monitored professional development scheme. It could be that you're a smaller, at a smaller organization where you use the supported registration scheme, 
or you might be using the Developing Engineers program, or you might simply have a spreadsheet on your desktop where you record your main achievements. But as an applicant, you need to build up evidence of meeting the five UK spec competence requirements. UK spec is the framework against which all applicants are assessed, and UK spec stands for UK standards for professional engineering competence. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. And then the third part of the process is you need to provide evidence of how you meet the competence requirements in an application form, and you need to attend a professional review interview. So our session today is really to give you the inside track on what our assessors will be looking for in your application form when you submit it. And if you're successful at professional review interview, you'll be awarded registration. So UK spec is the framework against which all professional engineers are assessed, and it was updated in September of 2021, and we are now conducting professional review interviews against the U new UK spec 4 framework from January of 2022. So you'll notice if you go onto our website that the guidance notes have been updated. And I've just included here a screenshot of the guidance notes, but Philip will also share the link to the guidance notes in the chat with you. And if you're not already familiar with the framework, I'd encourage you to just click on the links here in the website. Uh, Philip will also share the links with you as well. Um, and just read the framework which is applicable for the grade of registration that you're applying for, and also have a look at the score guide as well. So again, I've just taken a screen grab to show you exactly what it looks like. So you can see here on the screen at the moment is a summary of the competence requirement for IENG, and competence A is on the screen at the moment. So you can see here where there's an overview of the competence requirement, there's the two sub-elements of that particular competence requirement. And here, the information that's probably most of interest to you as an applicant are examples of how you as an applicant could meet the competence requirement in question. Now, I've just included a screen grab today for competence A, but if you go online, you can see the entire portfolio for both NCHEC, IENG, and CENG across each of the five competence requirements. And one of the requirements now with UK Spec 4 is that an app, as an applicant, you need to show us that you've met each of the requirements. You can see the language here has changed to saying that you shall use a combination of general and specialist engineering knowledge and understanding. That means it's a requirement that must be met. So just to be aware of that when you're constructing your application form. When you attend for interview, you'll be asked lots of questions based around the information you've included in your application form, and the assessors will score you based on the answers that you provide them with and the information in your application form. And they will score you from a level one up to a level four. Now, as an applicant, in order to be successful, you must get awarded a score of three level threes and two level twos by both of the assessors. With UK spec, one of the new requirements, which is competence D3, is that applicants need to be able to demonstrate um, an awareness of diversity and inclusion issues. I'm just focusing in on that today because it's a brand new requirement that some of you may not be aware has been introduced. Um, so I've included a little bit of information about diversity and inclusion on the session today, just so that you're aware of it, because if you're not familiar with the UK Spec 4 changes, you may not be aware of this new requirement. So I've just included a very brief overview of exactly what we mean by diversity, uh, which is all about respecting and appreciating what makes each of us different, and also inclusion, which is a sense of belonging. And Another way of thinking of it is diversity as being the, the mix and inclusion is making the mix worth, work. So diversity without inclusion is useless. And there are, there's lots of evidence out there as to the business benefits that having diverse teams can bring to businesses and organizations. 
And there's lots more information about diversity, equity and inclusion on our website. I've just included screen grabs here of some of the resources that are available. So there's an A to Z of DNI terms. There's also podcasts that you can listen to. And just to give you some food for thought, you know, you might want to think about, you know, are you, for example, an ally? Um, have you thought about neurodiversity? Have you perhaps introduced a DNI moment at the start of meetings that you run? Have you spoken up and called out inappropriate behaviour, for example? Um, lots of resources are available, so if you're not already comfortable or familiar with this topic, educate yourself. But in terms of an applicant, the kind of questions that may come up for you at your professional review interview could be, what does diversity, equity and inclusion mean to you and why are they important? In your opinion, what's the most challenging aspect of working in a diverse environment? Another one could be, have you undertaken diversity and inclusion training? Or another one could be, what is your approach to understanding the perspectives of colleagues from different backgrounds? So new questions that may come up at the professional review interviews throughout 2022 will relate to diversity and inclusion. But in terms of your application form, you're probably looking at about 150 words in the application form. Uh, but just to mention it to you today because it's a brand new requirement that you may not be aware of. Now, when it comes to completing your application form, there are two versions of the application form available. There's an editable PDF version, which you can see on the screen at the moment, on the left-hand side of the screen, and there's the online version here on the right-hand side of the screen. So while they look a little bit different, the content is exactly the same. And I'm going to go through with you exactly what the assessors will be looking for from you in your application form when you submit it. Now, part F is a summary of your responsibilities and achievements. And I would have to say in the past two years, it's a part of the application form that I frequently find myself reviewing for applicants and giving more detailed advice on this section of the application than other parts of the application form. And that's, I think, because people frequently fall into making the same mistakes. So the slides I've prepared for you today is to avoid this happening with your application. So when the applications, when, sorry, when the assessors look at your application form, in the overview section or part F, they will be looking for a brief explanation of your employer and the nature of its business. So many applicants presume that because they're working for a very large blue chip company that's well known perhaps internationally, they assume that the assessors will know the organization, the nature of its business, etc. Don't assume that they will know that. Explain that to them in your application form, please. Also, it's important to bear in mind that as an applicant, the assessors will not see any MPDS reports or SRS reports. We only see those when we do an accreditation visit. So on the day of your interview, the assessors will only be reviewing your application form. So if there's anything that you feel is relevant to your development as a competent professional engineer, you will need to include that in the application form, please. They also prefer to see a narrative, not bullet points. A lot of applicants are trying to get so much information detailed in the application form. They just cut and paste, for example, from a job description or for a CV, and it's in bullet point format. That's not what the assessors will be looking for. They will be looking for a narrative, please. And they're also looking to see how you, as an applicant, have developed in your career as an engineer before they meet you during the face-to-face -face interview. Please also introduce any of the projects or specialist terms, acronym, jargon, abbreviations that you're going to use later in the application form in this part F of the document. So this is an opportunity for you to introduce those specialist terms, but you do need to write them out fully before you use the abbreviated version, please. Once you've explained them, you can then later in the document use the abbreviated version of the acronym or jargon or abbreviation that you're using or technical term, whatever it might be. 
They will also be looking for a writing style that flows well. So don't, for example, explain various projects in part F of the application form, and then go on and talk about totally different projects that you haven't mentioned anywhere later in demonstrating how you meet the competence requirements. They're also looking for answers to the questions that we ask you in the application form. And if you can, in part F, make it easier to read by leaving a line between each job, space permitting, of course. So bear in mind that all applicants use the same application form, whether you've five years experience or 25 years experience. And the only applicants who use a different application form are those applicants who work in the Defence Forces. But my colleague Jill is able to provide specialist advice on that if, if that's the sector in which you're employed. But ultimately, your goal when writing up your application form is to make it so that the assessors don't have to resort to using Google or another search engine in order to understand any of the terminology that you used in your application form, in order to understand your employer, the nature of its business, etc. That's the goal you need to have in the back of your mind when you're writing up the application form, please. I often get asked, who are the assessors? So I thought it would be useful to share some information on who the assessors are with you today. So assessors are chartered or incorporated members or fellows who volunteer to undertake professional review interviews with us. So the requirement is that the uh, they are, are professionally registered with the institution, and then they have to undertake training before they can act as a professional review interview assessor. But I think it's important to put yourself into the shoes of the assessor as an applicant. So think of it in terms of they typically will interview four applicants during the course of a day of professional review interviews. And they have a lot of information to read from each applicant. So if you think in terms of each application form consists of an overview, which is about 600 words in length, that's part F of the application form. Then you're allowed up to about 400 words for each of the competence requirements. And as you know, there are five competence requirements. You also need to include a development action plan, an organization chart, and your sponsor details in your application form. So in total, you as an applicant will be submitting about 3,000 words. They'll typically interview four applicants during the course of a day. But those four applicants could be from four totally different industry sectors. So make life easy for them. Show them that you have read the guidance notes, that you understand them, and that you've tailored the content of the application form to meet the requirements. Also important to bear in mind that we don't, up, don't match up applicants with assessors from the same industry sector. So if, for example, you're an applicant based up in Aberdeen and you're working in oil and gas, on the day of your professional review interview, your first assessor could be, for example, George, who's based down in Warrington and has worked in the nuclear sector. The second assessor could be Fred, based in Bristol, who's perhaps a retired academic. And the professional review interview facilitator could be Mary, based down in London, who's had a career in the rail sector. And during the course of a day of interviews, those, four, those three assessors and, and facilitators that I've just mentioned could be interviewing you working in oil and gas in Aberdeen plus somebody working in biomedical engineering, somebody else with a career in academia and somebody else who's been working in the automotive sector. So that I think highlights how important it is to make sure that your ap application is clear and concise so that the assessors can build up a good picture of who you are and what your main achievements have been before they meet you during the face-to-face -face interview. So do think of the application from the perspective of the reader and make life easy for them by showing them that you've understood and followed the guidance notes, please. So for example, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people assume that because their employer is a large organization, that the assessors, assessors will automatically be familiar with it. Um, so instead of stating, for example, project engineer at ABC Refinery, and then thinking that because it's a huge refinery occupying a huge site that everybody will be familiar with it, include a couple of sentences that put that organization into perspective. 
so that the assessor, perhaps abroad or another part of the country, can understand your employer and the nature of its business. Don't, for example, include, you can see here these few sentences on the screen at the moment, I'm the ED, ENDL responsible for a proposed SZC via a FIDIC contract. That's pretty much gobbledygook that perhaps the author and the sponsors can understand because they've all been working together, but somebody outside of the organization won't be able to understand. So make sure that you provide an overview of the employer and the nature of its business, please. And if you use a clear and logical approach when writing your application, that will ensure that the assessors can get a good understanding of who you are and what you've been doing without having to resort to Google and without having to spend a lot of additional time on your application form. So the kind of pitfalls you want to avoid, please, are providing scant detail, assuming that the assessors will see things like your NPDES reports or SRS reports if you've been following that system. Also, assuming that the assessors will be familiar with your unique acronyms and jargon. Some people offer the job description as evidence, and of course your job description tells us what you should be doing. We need to know what you've actually done and what your main achievements have been. Some people keep the best projects that they've been working on out of the application form and plan on sort of producing them with a flourish during the course of the interview. No, you need to detail the best evidence of how you meet the requirements in the application form, please. A lot of people then also include irrelevant information and wasting word count on it. Focus in on what your main achievements have been over the last five to six years maximum, please. And a lot of applicants fall into the trap of, because as an engineer you tend to be working as part of a team and you tend to write in the third person all the time, you forget that for this particular purpose you need to be able to write in the first person. So you need to make sure that you use language which clarifies what you have done. Some people then make claims that can't be backed up in evidence. They will say, for example, that they're the company's expert on finite element analysis, and then when they're asked a question on that topic, they're not able to back up the claim. Equally, other people will say they are expert communicators, and then send in an application form to us that's full of spelling mistakes, grammatical errors, etc. You can't tell us everything that you've been doing throughout your entire career, but you know and understand your career better than we do, so please pick out the highlights and use those as vehicles to demonstrate your competence. So what are the best tips to share with you today in terms of what you should be doing? So as I said earlier, all applicants use the same application form apart from the Defence Forces. Pick out two or three meaty or big projects or pieces of work, ideally contrasting if possible, that you can talk about confidently. Bear in mind that you want to show the assessors that you've got both depth and breadth of experience. And make sure you write your application in the first person using language that identifies what you have been doing. So try to use language like I've analysed, I compared, I considered, I defined, I investigated, etc. Also, make sure you tell us about the outcome. So as a result of your activities, were you able to make your product cheaper, lighter, faster, more fuel efficient, easier to install, easier to commission, easier to maintain, easier to decommission, safer? What were the business benefits that were gained as a result of your activities? Now, some applicants like to start off with competent E because for each competence, you need to provide us with about 400 words of text. And you can answer each sub-competence or you can just provide a block of text that covers both of the sub-competencies within your answer. However, for competent E, it's divided down into five sub-elements and you need to write out about 80 words for each sub-element. So some people like to start off with competence E because it's a little bit more structured and it's easier to answer that. And it means then you think when you're writing your application form, great, I've got E done, I've only got the other four to do now. 
Don't forget to include any skills that you have gained or acquired outside of the workplace. So if, for example, you have been working on STEM activities, if you've been doing sports coaching or any other activities where the skills are transferable, make sure you mention them in your application form. We also recommend that you get a friend or colleague or partner to proofread the application form for you before you submit it because we're all guilty or we can all be guilty of reading what we think we've written rather than what we've actually written. And of course my colleagues and I regularly run workshops where we can provide you with guidance on constructing your application form. It can also be useful to decide on and prepare the supporting evidence for your interview. So if, for example, you've got two equally good projects, you're not sure which one to detail in the application form, I would encourage you to pick out the one where you've got supporting evidence, for example, photographs or drawings that you can share with the interview panel during the course of your interview. And I always recommend to applicants that they keep the STAR acronym in mind when constructing their application form. And that's a very little simple acronym where you state the engineering problem, then describe the engineering analysis of the problem, the engineering solution that you devised, and then the results. Just an admin point to draw your attention to, make sure you have the most up-to-date version of Adobe installed when you're writing your application form up. And if you're using the online version of the application form, you need to go to the very last page of the application form to download a copy, which you can then share with your sponsors, or you can share it with one of the business development team if we've agreed to review your application form for you. We normally review application forms for people who haven't been on MPDS. If you've been on MPDS, your mentor will be able to do that review for you. I've also included today just a sample answer for competence A, just to share with you how this applicant has followed the guidance notes and used the writing style that we ask applicants to use. And this is just really so that you can refer back to this slide after the session today, just to give you some food for thought and an example of how an applicant has used the recommended writing style. So you can see here this applicant has written in the first person, they've highlighted what, highlighted what they've achieved, and they've also written this answer in such a way that a non-engineer could read this and easily understand what they've achieved. So again, just to give you some ideas and food for thought in terms of how to construct your answers. Your answers for the competence requirements might read very, very different to this particular answer, but you can see the point I'm trying to make here. You also need to include in the application form a, a copy of your organization chart. And within that, we're not looking for names and titles. We are looking for the job roles that they hold and whether they're professionally registered or not. That's the main piece of information that we're looking for in your application form. You also need to include a development action plan, and that's where you just provide to us some information on how you're going to keep your level of competence up to date going forward. Because as a professionally registered engineer, you need to commit to doing CPD. And I have devised a little acronym here uh, which summarizes all of the activities that will count as CPD. So self-study, academic study, volunteering, attending events, attending training courses, but also the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis will present you with lots of opportunities for CPD. I think it's fair to say that most engineers do CPD as a matter of course, but aren't always perhaps very good at logging that CPD. So get into the habit of either using the tools that we provide you with or a spreadsheet on your desktop to log your CPD and reflect on what you're achieving. And in your short-term goals, make sure you include that one of your goals is to gain either chartered or incorporated engineer registration. It might seem blindingly obvious, but you can include it in the application form. So what will happen after you submit your application form to us, 
we will process it and if there's enough information in it to conduct a good robust interview we'll invite you to attend your professional review interview and we're currently conducting those interviews via a four-way meeting on Microsoft Teams so there'll be yourself there'll be your two assessors and there'll be a professional review interviews facilitator the facilitator is really just there to ensure that the interviews are conducted fairly and that the standards are maintained and the interview will last for about 45 minutes to an hour Hour maximum and you'll be doing most of the talking so the assessors will ask you open questions and you'll be doing most of the talking on the day and your goal is to give them enough information that they can award you the minimum scores of three level threes and two level twos uh, you don't get the results on the day the interview panel will make a recommendation which will then be endorsed by our professional review committee so do make sure that you're familiar with the scoring system and again Philip has earlier shared the link to the scoring system so that you can read through that if you're successful you'll be elected as a member of the institution and registered with the engineering council if you're not successful, you can reapply. But please do bear in mind that the success rate at interview is very high, it's over 92%. So the vast majority of applicants are successful. But do please remember to try and enjoy yourself. It's an opportunity for you to talk about your career and what you've achieved in front of an interested audience. And there are very few opportunities in life when you get the opportunity to do that. So try to relax and make sure that you prepare well for your interview like you would for any professional business meeting. And we again regularly run sessions to provide you with tips on preparing for the interview. And there are also recordings from some of these earlier sessions on our YouTube channel. So thank you all very much for joining me today. I do hope that's been useful. Um, I can see I've just stuck within the 30 minute time frame. The idea was to have a short session to provide you with as much information as possible. So we don't have time for questions and answers just now, but if you do have a question relating to anything that I've covered during the topic today, please don't hesitate to get in touch either with myself, I'm Sandra, um, or one of my colleagues who are part of the business development team. And as I said earlier, a set of these slides will be sent out to anybody who's requested them. If you haven't requested a set of these slides and you'd like a copy, again, please just drop me an email. So thank you all very much for joining me and I do hope we'll see you at some of our other workshops later in the year. And don't forget that we're here to help you and guide you through the process of gaining your professional registration. Thank you all very much and I will say goodbye to you for just now. Thank you.